Welcome, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being here. My name is Sadna Samaranayaka, and I'm a co-author of the State of Economic Inclusion Report 2021 and a consultant at the Partnership for Economic Inclusion at the World Bank. And it is my absolute pleasure to moderate this session on designing economic inclusion programs for women's empowerment. First, a few logistics. <clears throat> this session is being presented to you in English, Spanish, French, and Arabic languages. So please look for the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom and select the relevant channel. Now, if you're having connection issues or trouble selecting your language, please let us know through the chat box and IT will assist you. Please use the chat box to participate in the conversation, send us questions, we'll aggregate those questions and look to pose them to the panelists at the end of the session. And finally, if you have any information, articles to share, research that's particularly relevant to this topic, please do email us at PIMT at worldbank.org. Right. So with that, let's get to the topic at hand. Time poverty, a lack of assets, a lack of income, savings, education, a lack of access to health care. These are the daunting realities of poverty that disproportionately affect women. And these are also the realities that in many contexts are synonymous with reinforcing harmful gender norms and critical gender gaps, perpetuating a lack of empowerment, agency, and a poverty of hope. Now, bundled economic inclusion interventions are uniquely placed to address the multiple constraints that poor women face and to, and to empower them beyond the economic domain. Now, over the course of the next hour, I will ask you two questions, the first of which you'll see now. So if you could please launch the first poll. We thought it useful to ask this group of practitioners, technical partners, funders, in your experience, how effective are economic inclusion programs at advancing women's empowerment? First, that they're not very effective. Second, that they're moderately effective. There are some gains in empowerment, that, but there's room for improvement. And that finally, you felt that they were very effective. So let's give this a, a little bit of a second to build as you're, as you're answering. Why do we ask this question? When, when we researched uh, extensively for the State of Economic Inclusion report, we found that 88% of all programs surveyed report that they prioritize female participants. And then of those 64% of these programs say that women constitute most of their participants. But we know that prioritizing female participants doesn't necessarily mean advancing women's empowerment. So we wanted your gauge on this question. So I think you'll see that, you know, while there is some optimism, I think most of us, many of us feel that there really is room for empowerment. And we hope that this session can give you some ideas on how to do that. Let's take away the poll and have the next slide, please. So, um, Rather than be inhibited by uh, a narrative of constraints and barriers to realizing a woman's potential, can we instead set into motion a virtuous cycle? Economic inclusion programs attempt to address several of the key constraints that women face, right? So it's a bundled intervention. We provide cash, assets. We encourage savings discipline. We provide training, business training, coaching. So that's everything that you see on the right side of your screen, direct to households. But can these programs and their inputs also have an impact, not just at the household level, but also at the community level by addressing harmful gender norms and biases? Can they also activate social capital and build confidence in women beneficiaries? Can we set into motion a virtuous cycle where women's agency and empowerment is enhanced by economic inclusion programs? If we could have the next slide. So what does this session aim to do? In this session, we want to understand the operational insights that we can learn from the field. And we want your key takeaways to be the operational realities, programming that's designed to empower women through economic inclusion interventions is not easy work to do. And we want to communicate the iterative nature of getting these interventions right. And we want you to have a sense of the common themes and promising avenues that are emerging in enhancing women's economic empowerment across very different implementation contexts. So today, we have a stellar panel of women to bring to you insights from a large-scale government program in Zambia, 
insights gleaned over several NGOs working in the at the intersection of economic inclusion and gender empowerment, as well as insights from the World Bank's gender lead in social protection and jobs. This session complements the plenary session, which follows immediately afterwards, which brings together global thought leaders to reflect on how to realize the transformative pot potential of government led economic inclusion programs for women's empowerment. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today our very first panelist, Ms. Grace Kawimwila. She's a program specialist for the Supporting Women's Livelihood component of the JEWEL program. Uh, it's a project based out of the Ministry of Community Development and Social Services in the government of Zambia. Grace brings 15 years of experience in designing and implementing girls and women's empowerment programs in analyzing gender issues and integrating insights at the national, provincial, district, and community levels. Welcome, Grace. Thank you very much, Satna, for the introductions, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about the girls' education and women's empowerment and livelihoods, uh, duo in short, uh, project. I want to thank the PEI team and the rest of the audience that have joined in. It's indeed a great opportunity to be talking about the Zambian experience with regards to girls' education and women empowerment. So to go straight into the presentation, I would like to talk about uh, Duo as a pioneer in its explicit focus on girls and women's empowerment. Our project de is designed uh, based on the policy documents uh, in the seventh national development plan and the national social protection policy. And this is in line with government's aspirations of reducing uh, poverty and vulnerability, especially among girls and women in rural areas. The DUO project is implemented by three line ministries, the Ministry of Community Development and Social Services, which is supporting women. Through an economic uh, uh, package. And this uh, economic uh, package uh, targets women from uh, uh, social cash transfer households. We also have the Ministry of uh, General Education that is implementing the uh, keeping girls in school and targeting uh, secondary school bursaries for adolescent girls from very poor uh, households uh, under the social cash transfer. The other component is the social cash transfer, which of course uh, was launched in 2003 and targeting us uh, reaching uh, 600,000 uh, households. I must say that uh, in the additional financing, the social cash transfer has come on board to support more households. So for this uh, presentation, I will not talk about uh, all the three components. I'll specifically talk about the supporting women's uh, livelihoods uh, component. So to talk about the potential of economic inclusion uh, to empower women, this uh, project is uh, designed in a way that it brings a comprehensive uh, package. The rationale is uh, built on growing evidence of graduation programs in the region, as well as uh, savings groups uh, in the country. We know that economic interventions that uh, address uh, women empowerment programs has uh, an opportunity to increase uh, women's livelihood. So under the DUO project, we have uh, different components. We have the savings group component. Uh, we have uh, the life and business skills uh, training where we target uh, beneficiaries to take them through a 21 days training. And then we give them a productivity grant of uh, US dollar 225. There's uh, mentoring and peer support as well as um, home visits that provide scope for engaging uh, the household more broadly. The new generation of impact evaluations uh, also expands the set of indicators to look at different dimensions of women's empowerment, including intra-household, decision-making, self-esteem, and psychosocial well-being, including social capital. Throughout our project design, we also have a grievance redress uh, mechanism that is implemented at every community throughout the project cycle. We know that when we are designing programs that uh, target women, 
there are unintended consequences. And these consequences are very common in the communities, in countries. And if we fail to address these uh, underlying gender inequalities, they may prove to be a challenge in future. So it's always good to look at uh, what these uh, issues may be. Some of the issues that we have documented and we've seen from experience and research includes uh, exacerbated time poverty, reinforced uh, traditional gender roles, as well as increased uh, partner violence, IPV, due to perceived threat to traditional masculine and gender roles within the household. With the unintended consequence of targeting women, what then would be our goal? We would want to incorporate the gender, uh, gender intentional design in every programming that we are implementing if it's going to target women. The dual project under the additional financing aims to strengthen its impact on women's empowerment by incorporating these series of gender intentional adaptations. Mm -hmm. So just to explain a little bit more on what we are doing as a project, we are expanding social networks through savings groups that are open to non-beneficiaries. Initially, the savings groups were just targeting the women that are on the program. We do implement a curriculum on life and business skills. So on the life and life skills uh, component, we have added the sexual and reproductive health piece that should be able to enable women make informed uh, better fertility decisions. We've tried to incorporate in our implement implementation uh, a design that would challenge and equal gender norms by engaging husbands and male community members. While we try to implement these uh, gender intentional designs, we also look at enhancing a gender sensitive grievance redress mechanism so that our voices in the community are improved and represented. Currently, we are implementing an impact evaluation and uh, pending results from the midline uh, results do indicate that a comprehensive package is what is needed to achieve a real change in the lives of the beneficiaries that we are saving. So right now we've added not only a component on sexual reproductive health, but we've also added the consumption support. Previously would target uh, beneficiaries from uh, households that were not uh, under uh, uh, social cash transfer, but uh, in trying to incorporate this gender intentional design, we are now uh, targeting the social cash transfer households where women who are fit for work and age between 19 and 64 uh, will be on the program. So what are we saying about incorporating gender intentional design? We say implementing bundled interventions through government structures also requires not only capacity building, as you have seen the different interventions where we are trying to redesign our program. We are looking at delivering project components with a view to train officers at government and uh, community level to address uh, gender biases. In addressing gender biases and trying to improve um, the economic situation and the livelihoods of the women we save, we are looking at enhancing the savings group component. Initially, in the sequencing of the projects, we started with the training in life and business skills, but currently we are starting with the savings uh, component in the addition of financing. And this is to increase savings behavior, to increase uh, economic opportunities, as well as uh, financial inclusion where uh, savings is concerned. Because we know for a fact that uh, savings groups are just um, as much about building social capital as expanding access to finance, since their success and sustainability is contingent on the solidarity between members. Also research has shown that uh, funding savings component may not be very sustainable. So once we encourage beneficiaries to start saving from the onset, we know that there's potential in improving sustainability of the project even beyond its time frame. Uh, like earlier mentioned, the component that has been added to the training curriculum on sexual and reproductive health does not just support uh, 
fertility decisions, but this was also as a result of the additional topics that the beneficiary wanted, such as family planning through the process evaluation that was conducted. So with this training, in the first three phases of the project, we've been able to implement a 21-day training. Positive impact of cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm. I, I think the group itself. Uh, sorry, I'm having feedback. Uh, uh, may I continue? Yes, please continue. Okay, thank you very much, Sadna. The training is... Uh, conducted right in the communities, and we are trying to train beneficiaries on soft skills, as well as business skills. Soft skills, because we know that uh, assumptions that, are, um, that um, think uh, women are constrained in their livelihoods will be dealt with. When you start looking at uh, topics on go, 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 um, decision-making, uh, goal setting, and then you go straight into the technicalities of uh, business skills, you will have a beneficiary that will be able to um, just go through the sessions with uh, much more confidence. So the project that has been uh, redesigned is better aligned with similar projects that are targeting the poor. And um, this is in order to address uh, the social, economic and health needs of the beneficiaries. I would want to point at this time that uh, in implementing this redesigned uh, program, we did uh, partner with BRAC, not only on the component on uh, revising the life skills uh, curriculum on introducing the sexual and reproductive health, but also on engaging men. In any program that is designing uh, or targeting women, there's need to engage men to empower and protect uh, women. So in our curriculum, we have uh, added uh, joint sessions and community dialogue so that we can have a buy-in from the male members of the community, as well as set out objectives from the beginning of the project. And um, lastly, on the design that has uh, been uh, implemented uh, during uh, the implementation of the dual project, just to explain more on the GRAM uh, uh, channel, which is a grievance redress uh, mechanism, we have uh, three different channels that the community members are able to use to air their grievances. And this includes a lockable uh, box where written complaints are submitted or a, a, a complainant may go through a person uh, in our community. We call them uh, community focal point persons, and these are female, or using the hotline, which uh, is used for beneficiaries and other people to just uh, air their grievance. The rollout has included a robust awareness raising campaign, including uh, mapping a GBV referral pathway. So you can see this poster on the right. This is something that we are using as an IEC material just to communicate to the members of the public the different services that are there in terms of uh, addressing issues with the, uh, uh, relating to gender-based uh, violence and where they can report to. Our early exper uh, experience uh, using the grievance redress mechanism includes um, using both boxes for complaints and the hotline. When you look at the percentage of the complaints that are coming through, and these complaints include exclusion complaints, inclusion complaints, and so forth, you find that 25% uh, are non-dual and 60% of these are SWL, the supporting women's livelihood, of which 93% are other or exclusion. What does this mean? This means that uh, we are not just using the grievance redress mechanism in the community just to target the beneficiaries that are on the program, but we've received complaints, a lot of complaints from other communities and others that do not relate to the project, including complaints on uh, sexual exploitation and abuse, as well as uh, sexual harassment. So we know that this system is not just addressing the needs in the community that are just targeting the women that are on the program, but there are other members in the community that are be benefiting from this mechanism. The, if, I could, uh, if I could ask you to wrap up in about a minute. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Sadna. So just going straight to the lessons that have been learned, um, 
We know prioritizing gender in the recruitment of uh, project staff and specifically talking about the community based volunteers at community level can come at an expense of other qualifications, such as in uh, literacy levels. Women have limited ownership and access to key assets, including phones and bikes that require creative solution for delivering the grant. Our beneficiaries receive their productivity grant through a digital payment. So the project has developed a unique choice-based payment system. And the other lesson that we've learned is that GBV is a real concern in most texts, in most contexts, and the projects that are targeting women should in instances where there may be rare cases of gender-based violence still put something in place to prevent GBV. And lastly, uh, continuous lesson and cost adjustment are critical. And this is in parallel with strengthening the M&E system, project evaluation and assessments that are useful for identifying gaps and making necessary adaptations in order to improve the way we do business. Thank you very much, Satna. Thank you so much, Grace. I, I hope that, I mean, that was really a comprehensive uh, presentation given given the time limits. I think hopefully the audience has a really good sense of the iterative nature of this, how Jewel sort of came to certain conclusions about sort of enhancing the social capital piece with the savings group platforms, how the GRM mechanism was introduced, and then how multiple additional pathways for submitting uh, grievances were introduced, and how it's it's really been kind of a, an adaptive design process along the way. Thank you, Grace, for that uh, presentation. So next, uh, over to our next panelist, Professor Sonia Laszlo. She's an associate professor of economics at McGill University where her research, among other areas, examines the microeconomic effects of social policies and conditions uh, in the areas of education, health, and labor markets, but with a focus on women. Professor Laszlo's research includes analysis of the work of eight NGO implementers working at the intersection of economic inclusion or graduation programs and women's empowerment. Professor Laszlo, over to you. I believe you're on mute. Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you to uh, the PEI team for inviting me and also to Grace for her wonderful presentation. Um, let me just dive right into um, to my slides. Um, so I know I won't spend much time on this. I think everybody that's in the audience already has a good sense of why we want to focus on gender and graduation if we consider empowering women as being a goal in and of itself, but also as a means to an end when it comes to implementing implementing programs uh, around economic inclusion, this makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, women make up um, a large proportion of the poorest and uh, most vulnerable portions of the population. Um, we also know that, um, you know, from a economic growth and productivity perspective, it makes a lot of sense. The social dividends uh, related to children um, and children's human capital accumulation, civic participation. But I think what we really want to focus on here is the fact that we know that from the perspective of um, you know, triggering long-term sustainable program impacts, we know that there's a lot of return to increasing women's agency, autonomy, and empowerment. And uh, as I will be discussing, um, the organizations that I've uh, worked with um, have uh, really tried to get to the bottom of trying to understand the structural barriers that have, uh, in you know, his more historical terms, really perhaps at some point prevented uh, implementation from, from going as smoothly as possible. And so what I will be discussing is a paper uh, that I put together with one of our really fantastic undergraduate students here at McGill, Anushka Bari, where um, I worked with these eight organizations, BOMA, BRAC, Concern, Fon Jose, uh, Fondation Capital, Trickle Up, Village Enterprise, and Women for Women, on trying to get a sense of uh, the different practices, policies, and procedures that these organizations have brought in to really try to make uh, uh, long-term changes in 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 um, 
how these programs can really affect change uh, in non-economic outcomes uh, for women beneficiaries of their programs. So one of the things that I should point out before uh, getting into some of the details is that these are eight organizations that have, uh, over the many years of operating, really recognized and invested a lot in trying to understand how to make these sorts of uh, changes uh, last um, more sustainable. Um, but what's also quite interesting is that uh, these are organizations that work in very different uh, contexts, many different countries. There's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the different components of the multifaceted programs um, that they're implementing. And also, depending on the program and de depending where they're operating, there's also a lot of variation in the degree of linkages with national programs. And so even though they're all graduation programs, they are working in very different contexts. And yet there are some commonalities that we can take away from that. So before I go into some of the key takeaways, I think it's useful to get a sense of some of the um, sort of conceptual issues of why it's important to, to think about this and where we might be able to find those components that have a very strong return in terms of trying to really affect change in non-economic outcomes for women. And so here I'll call your attention to this diagram that I have on the, uh, on, on the right, um, where we can think about change really on two dimensions, uh, both from the individual going down to the communal and institutional, and then um, sort of like on this vertical here, or the, the horizontal here from informal to informal. And so we can break this space into these four quadrants. Uh, this is actually some work that comes from uh, Helen Brandt, uh, Rao, and Kelleher uh, in terms of trying to conceptualize where we can affect change. Um, and so this is slightly modified. Um, and so if we see the top right quadrant, we're looking at resources and opportunities as a means to try to bring in some changes to women's economic and non-economic empowerment. If we think about early generation uh, social protection or economic inclusion programs, if we're thinking about, you know, just cash transfer programs or asset transfer programs, savings incentives programs, we know that they do quite well at really bringing up resources and opportunities. I mean, they're designed in that way. What has been particularly interesting in the more um, sort of contemporary uh, and more recent forms of economic inclusion programs, and in particular multifaceted programs, is that they are trying to affect change in the other quadrants as well, right? And in particular, well being an agency and uh, social norms and cultural practices. And uh, Grace's presentation from Jewel really does uh, a great job at, at highlighting some of the, the key areas where the program, for example, in, 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 in Jewel has been able to, to make some changes there. And of course, linking with, um, with, with formal institutions and, uh, and government run um, initiatives is another um, key area. So uh, a main takeaway or a couple of main takeaways um, from the work um, that I conducted um, in looking at these best practices is that some of the elements of graduation programs that seem to be really, really effective um, are very promising in, in trying to bring change in non-economic outcomes of, um, of women beneficiaries are those that tend to overlap two or more of these different quadrants. And so just to give you a couple of examples that I'm going to pick up on in, in my subsequent slides, um, there are really two areas that, that I felt were worth mentioning that really come out of some of the early generation economic inclusion programs as being potentially barriers to, uh, to leading to long lasting change. And so those two are in particular mitigating um, potential backlash from male spouses and hostility uh, from non-beneficiaries. And then the second one uh, is really about tr challenging traditional gender norms and avoiding reinforcing traditional gender roles. And again, you know, Grace's presentation did, uh, um, you know, did show quite a bit uh, how we really need to think about those two particular um, barriers. And so what we really um, wanted to do with the, with the paper is to get a sense of um, some of the, the, the concrete measures that organizations have brought in to try to deal with these issues. All right. So uh, let me start with the, the first one, the issue of minimizing backlash. And so here, really, there's two forms of backlash that we want to think about. First, there's at the community level, and then the second one is more within the household. 
so most of the organizations that uh, that we worked with on this on this paper um, have introduced um, or you know have been operating uh, in terms of targeting beneficiaries within a, within the community. They've been looking at participatory wealth appraisals. So of course, as as as, as you probably know, this is where you bring in the community to determine who within the community is most poor, vulnerable, or um, or, or you know uh, deserving of the of the of the program being. Um, or of the benefit itself of the program. Um, and so by bringing in all of the community to agree on who uh, should receive the program, this will minimize the backlash from potential non-beneficiaries um, because they understand that those that receive the benefit are uh, very deserving of the benefit. One of the, uh, the very nice elements is, um, so BRAC, for example, has a grievance response mechanism where uh, households that um, did not um, you know, get included as a beneficiary in the targeting process have a mechanism with which they can, um, they can try to redress that. So that's from the um, community level at the household level, um, as Grace's presentation um, did a really great job at showing it's really important to engage with men and boys. Um, I know that most of the organizations um, have been uh, very active in trying to bring in um, men and boys into the discourse. Um, Concern in particular uh, has a couple of very interesting projects and in, in, um, uh, around this BRAC, Village Enterprise, um, and yet at the same time, um, some organizations have found that it, you know, as much as they're trying, it is sometimes very difficult to get men to, to, to participate. And so there's, it's not just a matter of not getting them to buy into it, it's just really hard to get them even to, to pay attention. Um, trickle up actually um, it gave a very nice example about how um, rather than having this being done by the organization to really have some of the self-help groups that are, are part you know groups of, of beneficiaries within the, 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 the community to try to take up some of that that role so if we think about for example the case where women are receiving a cash or an a cash transfer or an asset um, there's always the risk that um, their spouses are going to co-opt uh, that transfer, right? And so uh, one way that um, organizations have found that it's possible to try to redress that is by really training self-help groups to, um, uh, to intervene. Okay, of course, one of the issues is, you know, how to scale this up, especially participatory wealth appraisals we know are quite, um, can be quite expensive and time consuming. All right, um, the second area is to challenge gender norms. Uh, the organizations that uh, we worked with in this paper um, have recognized that it's very important to try to integrate this as early as possible in uh, programming. Uh, coaching seems to be a very, um, one of the components of graduation programs that seems to be especially well suited to, to bring in um, this, sort of, uh, this sort of discussion. Uh, Fundacion Capital through its observatorios, which are group discussions, village enterprise through uh, their family support module, engaging men and boys uh, module by concern are examples of that. What's also quite uh, interesting is that some of the organizations have actually recognized that it's not enough to try to challenge gender norms within the beneficiary communities, but sometimes one needs to uh, challenge gender norms even within the organization itself. Um, and so they've um, you know, uh, found some ways to, to do that. And then um, I guess finally, just to, to wrap up, um, I just wanted to maybe spend the last minute uh, talking briefly about a particular solution that Fundacion Capital is, is working on, which is to provide um, this sort of coaching um, around uh, gender equality issues, gender roles, stereotypes, violence against women and children, women in leadership, um, but to try to do it using a digital solution um, in a way that is both scalable and a way that is particularly useful to think about in the context of social distancing in these pandemic circumstances. And so I'm just going to leave off with a bit of a, a plug and a hook um, that um, we are actually currently working on a project to evaluate whether or not these sorts of digital technologies can actually change beliefs around gender norms using a behavioral economic study with their program uh, Igualdad in Paraguay. So I'm going to leave it there um, and, uh, and thank you very much much for uh, for your attention and for listening 
Thanks so much, Professor Laszlo. I wanted to ask you just a very quick clarifying question, if you could address within a minute or two. You mentioned that some, several of these organizations, in addition to looking at the question of sort of challenging gender norms in the community through things like coaching um, and, and through the social sort of groups, um, are also examining some of the gender norms that may be inherent within their own staffing structures. And could you just talk a little bit about how that's done? Is it sort of, is it messaging? Is it much more formalized training? training, what are some of these organizations doing? Yeah, so um, so my sense is that these organizations are doing a lot more than just informal conversations. Um, they're bringing in some formal training to try to, uh, to you know, gender sensitize their staff, especially the staff that is going to be interacting with local participants. Uh, Foncosé and, and Fondation Capital, for example, are two organizations that have actually uh, hired uh, gender consultants um, to really take a look and to deconstruct all of the operations from, you know, from, from beginning to end. Um, and that can sometimes be a very useful exercise to bring in some, you know, a, a gender expert really to, to, to try to take a look. So, I mean, those are, I think, the, the, the most, you know, formal examples of, uh, that I can think about, but I'm sure that there are others as well. Fantastic. Really, um, really heartening to know that despite a very different context and the different context of NGO implementers versus a large scale government program, that there are common themes and attention being focused on the same programmatic components and some of these same questions. So thanks so much for that fantastic presentation and compliment to Grace's. Um, with that, I'd like to bring um, into the picture our discussant for this session. Alessandra Heinemann is a senior social protection specialist and gender lead in the global practice for social protection and jobs. Her interests include economic inclusion programs, social protection delivery systems, and human-centered design. She's worked previously at the Asian Development Bank, OECD, and UNICEF on these issues. Alessandra, it's really a pleasure to have you here with us to discuss this issue. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So I think um, we can just do a little bit of a QA, and a um, a few questions back and forth, and I think it would be great to open it up to the audience. So audience, please do use the chat box to uh, send your questions our way. And then Alessandra, I'm also opening it up to you to pose some questions to our panelists as well. Um, first off, I'd like to know, Alessandra, from your position sitting uh, as a gender lead at SPJ at Social Protection Jobs at the World Bank and, and having a look into many uh, sort of cash plus programs that are attempting to layer in additional interventions to look more like economic inclusion programs to provide more whole scope interventions to poor households. Can you comment a little bit on, on Jewel specifically, on the program that Grace presented about and what makes it, um, you know, really a success story, right, within the bank and, and what is unique about it and what do you think the other practitioners here in this room might be able to take away? Uh, so I should start by saying that there are a million things that are fabulous about the Jewel. Um, I'm going to limit myself to three, um, but by all means, I would encourage everyone to sort of, you know, dig into that program because I think there's a lot of a lot of really fantastic um, you know design and implementation features uh, many of which uh, Grace um, touched on but of course it's impossible to do justice to such a great program in 10-12 in minutes. So to highlight three things that I think um, really stand out for me. Um, the first um, I think is that it's a really large-scale um, program that is entirely government implemented. Um, I think that's really no small feat, and I think the team has come up with really creative ways of, um, you know, engaging local government, engaging community volunteers, and I think particularly in the context of the sort of larger conversation about how do we scale those programs, how do we make sure that we bring down cost, I think the, the Jewel is a really interesting example. Second, um, I think from the gender perspective, what's really unique about Jewel is that I think they have managed to systematically exploit a lot of different entry points um, to design um, for women's economic empowerment. And I think, you know, if we if we look at the jewel at the jewel program um, carefully, those are really everywhere. So, for example, um, Grace just mentioned this in passing towards the end. But for, so, for example, in um, rolling out their digital payment. Um, mechanism, they decided to give women a choice of, you know, what provider to use, 
um, in rolling out their grievance mechanism, they came up with all these different avenues for women to um, access the service, um, you know, in convenient ways. Um, they've also been really thoughtful, I think, about engaging men and boys and trying to bring them along and build support for, uh, for women's empowerment. So I think what's interesting about the Jewel is that they're not thinking of women's economic empowerment as the sort of add-on, but I think it's really, you know, kind of ingrained and embedded in the, in the, in the DNA of the project, which um, I think is fairly unique. And then third, um, I think, what they've also done an amazing job um, at is really um, trying to focus on um, implementation and um, you know innovation within implementations. I think often we're very focused on the sort of high level design choices that we have uh, when conceiving of a program. Um, but I think there's probably just as much scope to you know to do better in in innovate in in iterating on on how the program is implemented and how the program is delivered so i think this is something that they've done um, really well and i think grace you know um, alluded to this so for instance they've found out that it's worth you know starting with the savings groups to you know build social capital and bring women's groups together so i think um you know just kind of being i suppose once you have your design sort of being agnostic and, and making sure that you continue to, to evaluate and iterate and, um, and, and innovate and in how you implement, I think is something that they've done really well. Um, Great, thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Um, for, for the practitioners in the room who, who want to sort of um, understand more or, or pick up from Jewel, what, what do you think, what, what would you point to, to be the sort of two or three sort of key takeaways? Um, sure, I mean, I think the, you know, the, the main, um, I think the, the main takeaway is probably um, not to think of, of women's economic empowerment as this external add-on, um, but to really realize that um, I think ultimately it's about thoughtful, inclusive design, and it's about um, making sure that you maximize opportunities where women um, can, you know, exercise voice and choice and agency and, of course, bringing men along in the process. Um, so, you know, it's not, I think women's economic empowerment is not this, you know, esoteric add-on that you sort of need to, um, you know, to bolt great. onto your intervention uh, once it's designed, but I think really sort of uh, you know, kind of following the model of the jewel, kind of looking for opportunities within the intervention itself, um, and how you how you maximize those opportunities for empowerment, I think is is is, is important. Thanks for that. Um, I also wanted to to um, ask you a question about both of these presentations before brought up the sort of topic of gender based violence, and. Um, different ways that the program is looking to mitigate against some of those consequences. And I know that you and your capacity have done a tremendous amount of research um, on the relationship between gender-based violence and uh, cash transfer programs, as well as economic inclusion programs. And I thought you might shed a little more light on some of that analysis. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Um, and just to clarify, so the research is actually not done by us at the World Bank. Uh, we're just consumers of, uh, you know, the excellent research that um, academics out there are, are doing and sort of trying to translate that and bring that um, to our operational te uh, teams. But I think um, on GBV, I think the important takeaway is that there is a, a growing body of evidence that suggests that when households receive cash transfers and you know, be these regular cash transfers or cash transfers in the context of economic inclusion programs, um, intimate partner violence um, and gender-based violence actually decreases. And I think interestingly, um, this happens um, even where the intervention is not actually designed to explicitly tackle gender-based violence. So if you if you like, it's just sort of a, a great byproduct, right, of the intervention that you know the infusion of cash into the household seems to have this effect of of, of reducing violence. And um, the hypothesis, of course, is that you know, and I think it's very plausible that you know the reduction in, in poverty and stress. Um, leads to a reduction in the, in the potential for conflict and, and in violence and then the other impact pathways that are thought to be at play um, are that these interventions um, you know strengthen women's social capital and also strengthen um, empowerment outcomes so that you know adds to the reduction of GDV. So 
of course, while GBV is, is a pervasive issue everywhere, um, I think we, you know, and we, we obviously we need to, to mitigate risk, but I think we shouldn't shy away from, from implementing programs um, that make women the sort of the primary recipient of the intervention, you know, the asset, the cash. Um, and on the contrary, I think we should start looking at um, cash transfers and economic inclusion interventions as really um, an opportunity, you know, to contribute to addressing um, GBV. And again, I think that doesn't mean, you know, designing uh, violence reduction programs. I think that's, it's just a matter of, you know, thoughtful, inclusive design that tries to maximize the kind of the preventive potential by, um, by being really thoughtful about how to how to empower women, how to bring men along, and how to, to mitigate risk um, where it exists. So we actually have a, um, a report with operational guidance on this um, that will be coming out next, um, next month. Um, so um, there, there's a lot, there, there will be a lot more detail on the, on the specifics in that. Great, thank you. And that, that actually brings me nicely to my next question, which is sort of from where you sit at the World Bank, um, what do you think is the next frontier in this space? What are the critical knowledge gaps? What are the things that you think governments, NGO technical partners, researchers need to focus on and understand better to accelerate this work? So I think the, you know, the evidence that we have is, is of course, really, really encouraging and exciting, um, and that's fantastic news. But, you know, I think as um, Professor Laszlo um, alluded to, obviously, both poverty and, um, you know, gender norms and gender relations are, are complicated, and it's not like there's one kind of, you know, one study or approach that is going to be a, a silver bullet, um, but I think it's really about um, replication, iteration, experimentation, and really trying to find the, the best intervention for, for different contexts. Um, and in particular, I think there's a lot of scope to, to work on the how of delivery and to really sort of try to innovate on, um, on the implementation front. Um, so, you know, I think kind of following the, the lead of the jewel and sort of, you know, continuing to, continuing to iterate and to sort of try to find, um, improvements at the margin to, to enable women to exercise choice and voice and agency and, and try to bring um, men and boys along where, where possible. I think the other um, area that we haven't really touched on um, is um, cost effectiveness. Okay. So I think, um, you know, I think as a as a practice, I think, you know, we could do, I think we could do better on, on cost effectiveness studies and just trying to understand, you know, what is really the kind of the most, um, the most cost effective kind of combination of, of program components um, mm -hmm. that can be implemented at scale. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alessandra. As, as you and I were discussing, I was noticing that Grace and, and Professor Laszlo were sort of making comments. I just wonder if I can quickly throw it back to either of you to see if you have anything that you'd like to add on to Alessandra's comments. And if not, we can start to take some questions from the audience. Maybe just to add on what Alessandra has just said, uh, with regards to gender-based violence, given the pervasiveness of GBV, even if uh, we know that our projects are not targeting uh, or trying to address issues uh, to do with gender-based violence, it's always important in the design to just look at preventive measures because we don't know what the future will hold. And I just want to reiterate the unintended consequences. The very fact that you've put in a GBV and grievance um, a redress mechanism doesn't necessarily mean that uh, in this particular project there is um, gender-based violence, but you are trying as much as possible before you look at uh, curative measures to put in preventive measures. I just thought I could just uh, bring out that point in addition to what Alessandra has just uh, pointed out. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Professor Lazo, would, would you like to, yeah. 
Yeah, so, uh, and I think this also responds to some of what I'm seeing in the, in the chat as well. Just on, on this issue of gender-based violence, of course, these issues are super complicated, right? So, um, you know, again, there's no silver bullet, but I guess the, the point is, is that, you know, these sorts of economic inclusion programs don't have to lead to increases in gender-based violence, especially if, you know, um, we start early on having that conversation with men uh, in the household, say, look, you know, this is not a zero-sum game in terms of power, right? I mean, you know, if we're supporting women, that doesn't mean that we're taking power away from you. In fact, this is good for you, right? So, so there's this notion that by uh, empowering the woman, we're actually doing something good for the household as, as a whole, uh, and that ultimately everybody within, within the household and the community benefits. I think that that's where, you know, really starting from the beginning, from targeting to designing the program, to implementing the program, to, you know, all steps um, is, is really a way to try to mitigate that sort of that sort of issue. Absolutely. So we have just a few more minutes, about two or three minutes, unfortunately, before we need to start wrapping up. But I wanted to ask a quick couple of questions from the audience. Um, uh, this is really to any of the panelists who would, would want to comment. But Jorge Maldonado asks, um, is there any experience to understand the difference between single mothers and married women, either sort of in implementation realities or an impact or an empowerment. Um, I wonder if, if either of you could address that. I mean, no, I think sure. Oh, go ahead, Alessandra, go ahead. I mean, maybe just briefly, I think that's a really excellent point. And I think it's true that when we speak about impacts, we tend to talk about average impacts, right? So it's really important. I think it's a really important question and that it reminds us that we need to, you know, obviously within women, it's a, like a very diverse category. And, you know, so for instance, the research on GBV shows that, you know, we see average reduction, if we see reduction effects on average, but there is, um, it, you know, it does affect different groups of women differently. So, um, you know, I think it's a, it's an it's an ex excellent point, and it's obviously hard to hard to generalize. But I think it's a it's an excellent reminder that you know um, you know this is the kind of analysis that I think programs need to do to understand um, different impacts on different groups of women. Professor Lazo, please add on. Yeah. So I mean, a, a couple of points here. I mean. It, it, to the extent that targeting is trying to reach the most vulnerable and poorest women, uh, they do typically be the single mothers, right, uh, disproportionately. So in some sense, there there is that that issue. But I guess one of the things, and, and we haven't talked much about the measurement piece, um, because we're, we're trying to figure out the the you know, impacts on uh, different beneficiaries. One of the problems, of course, with measuring empowerment is that a lot of the measures around agency and autonomy really have to do about decision making within the house. Household. And so that may make more sense when one's dealing with a household um, with multiple adults, adult decision makers, right? Single mothers tend to be the only decision maker um, by, by default, right? And so it, sometimes it can be actually quite tricky to um, try to think about how um, to even go about measuring the, uh, these differences, right, in, in terms of empowerment. Great, thank you. I'm going to pose another question, a, a fairly high level one. Um, so I, I'd love, um, Alessandra, if you could take this on first. Um, Wendy Chamberlain asks, how are organizations working to become, uh, or, or governments rather, working to become more um, gender transformative or gender transformational? Um, and and how, how are uh, these programs looking to operationalize gender equity? Uh, is this, is this a, a goal too far? Uh, are these, is, is a, is a goal like that outside of the remit of, of, uh, of some of the programs that we're talking about? Or do you start to see elements of, of not just looking at empowerment, but equity? I mean, I think, uh, <laughs> of course, I mean, of course, we are like, you know, everywhere we are a long, long way from uh, from real gender equality, right? Um, so, so it is. It is um, obviously a stretch goal. I think no matter where on, on planet Earth you are, um, if we sort of think back. I think we've lost you, Alessandra. I think Professor Laszlo, I think you, you might have had a, a comment on this question. 
Did you want to come in? Oh, I think we have you back. No, I didn't actually. <laughs> okay, we have you back. We just lost you for a couple of seconds, Alessandra. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so I, th I do think we are seeing programs exploit entry points a lot more systematically and doing, you know, sort of what they um, can on issues like social norms or, you know, sort of broader um, community relations. So, you know, while I don't think economic inclusion programs in and of themselves are going to solve uh, the gender equality issue, I do think they have a, a really significant contribution to make. Wonderful. Thanks so much. I think we could we could continue the conversation, but unfortunately, we are short on time. Um, if I could have the last poll launch, please. We we wanted to um, get a little bit of a pulse check from you again. Um, in your view, what are the critical areas for implementers to invest in or focus on? Um, Jack, if we could have the poll up. Thank you. Uh, so we're asking, do organizations need to focus more on targeting, on coaching and mentoring, on asset transfers? Um, is, it through, is it through the coaching um, or, or the skills training that we can really look to enhance um, some, of, some of the skills that are required to sort of help get women uh, to a place of greater agency? Uh, is it a real focus that is, is a real focus that's required on training, implementing staff to address some of these gender biases? Um, or is it about activities that mitigate against the unintended consequences that we've been talking about? Um, if we could, um, uh, if we could uh, have that poll up, please. I think it's this might be the wrong poll that you have up, Jack. Um, there we go. If we could have your quick take on these questions, this will help us understand um, as practitioners coming away from this session, uh, where you think you will be focusing your attention on uh, in terms of um, uh, the different programmatic aspects that you will be focusing on to ensure that your programs are more um, uh, gender transformative and impactful uh, in terms of creating empowerment for women. So we'll keep this up for just a second as you're answering. It seems like coaching and mentoring is a, is a critical one that we're looking at, um, the savings groups, uh, somewhat on the asset transfers and targeting. We'll keep this open for a few more seconds. Thank you. I think it's it's coaching overall that, that people feel is, is, is really critical to layering in some of these inputs. And then we have a couple of additional questions for you on your way out about whether you found this session useful. We could share the exit polls at this point. So how would you rate this session? And then secondly, whether you will use materials and ideas from this session for your work, your future work in this area. I'll give you a few minutes or a, a, about 30 seconds to respond there. The, the answers will not be shown or known to us. And finally, in the chat box, you will see a connection to your next session. We've really enjoyed having you here with us. Thank you so much. Grace Kabwimwila, Professor Sonia Laszlo, and Alessandra Hyman for joining us and uh, providing us with the benefit of your insights on this critical question of how to leverage economic inclusion programs for women's empowerment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sadna. Thank you.